Thank you. Um, so I'm going to be talking about climate factors influencing New Zealand pasture resilience under future climate change scenarios. Um, this work was funded by our land and water and our, the Deep South National Science Challenges. Um, and I'm part of a very large team, so I'd really like to acknowledge their contributions to this work. Oh, there we go. Okay, so the question um, that we're really interested in is how resilient are New Zealand pastures to climate change? So we've conducted a modeling study that examines regional pasture growth under um, projected climate change scenarios. So there's three parts to this study. There's the climate projections themselves. There's the biophysical models, um, which translate that into grass growth. And then there's a statistical analysis that we did um, to determine which factors were most important. We focused on three regions, um, Hawke's Bay, Southland, and Waikato. Um, these were chosen because they're um, important agricultural production areas, and they also represent um, different climates. There we go, okay. Um, so the climate projections themselves, um, this is the high emissions scenario, um, RCP 8.5. These are downscaled from global climate models. Um, so this is pretty much a worst case scenario, um, and this is end of the century. So temperature changes across New Zealand are about two to three degrees warmer. Um, rainfall is a bit mixed. Um, the wet areas get wetter and the drier areas get drier. So the west coast of the South Island is quite a bit wetter and um, the north and the east coast of the North Island are drier. To contrast this with the low emission scenario, this is RCP 2.6. Um, this is an aggressive mitigation scenario, um, kind of a Paris Agreement world. Um, there's actually very little change um, in the projections. So we've got a range of scenarios of possible futures um, that we'll explore. So our biophysical models um, span a um, range of complexity. Um, we have APSIM, which is um, a complex uh, pasture growth model, which is capable of representing management um, and grazing. And then we have a couple of simpler models, BioVGC and Watt Yield, um, which enable us to scale up at the regional scale. Um, the modeling is based on perennial ryegrass and white clover for the most part, um, and we haven't added much fertilizer or irrigation so that the um, impact of climate really comes out. Okay, so I'll jump straight into the results. This is from APSIM. Um, this is an example from the Waikato under the high emission scenario. Um, so it's a little bit hard to tell from these pictures, but there is an increase in total annual production. Um, the top is the present, middle is mid-century, and bottom is end of the century. That red dotted curve is um, repeated it's the present day curve, so you can see the change. Um, there is a shift in, uh, towards the um, spring, um, early spring, um, and away from summer. So you get that peak earlier in the season, um, and then you get a decline in the summer months. There's also more interannual variability. So those gray dots represent individual uh, years, and by the end of the century, they're much more spread out. So it becomes harder to predict what any given year will be like. So this is the regional scale results. Oops. Um, so this is the Hawke's Bay. Um, on the left is the low emission scenario. The right is high emission scenario. Uh, RCP 4.6 is somewhere in the middle. These are percent changes from a present day baseline. Um, so you can see that um, the annual pasture growth is positive um, pretty much across the board, that it increases with increasing emissions. Um, similar picture for Southland, again, an increase across the board, and the Waikato, again, um, with a little bit um, smaller of an absolute increase, but still um, positive. The seasonal picture um, is a little bit more nuanced. Um, so you get an increase in winter um, and in spring, but then you get this sharp decline in summer. Um, so this has potential to create a seasonal feed gap, and again, that's just because of those dry summers. So according to our statistical analysis, we looked at the importance of a number of temperature and water-related variables, um, and what came out on top were water-related variables. 
So we have the standardized potential evaporation um, index, which came out as most influential for both APSM and Biome BGC. So water over the summer months is really important, which come as no surprise. Um, so with that in mind, these are results from Watt Yield, which is a water balance model. So this describes water demand under different land covers. Um, on the left, you have a diagram comparing water demand under different land covers with pasture. So we have forest, kiwi, fruit, and maize. Maize is more demanding, um, forest is less demanding, and kiwi fruit comes out somewhere in the middle. Um, when we project that into the future, on the right, you see the change in water demand under, um, our, under the different scenarios. Um, what's interesting about this is that even though the water demand increases under all land covers, um, it increases more under forest. So forest um, might end up being on a par with pasture in the future. So to summarize, um, water-related variables are really important. The overall picture is positive. Annual growth increases. However, we do get a decline in summer um, to go along with the increase in winter and spring. Seasonal and interannual variability increases, making it harder to predict what will happen on any given year. Um, but this is largely um, good news because we're not talking about huge changes here. Farmers already deal with dry summers. Um, so we, in, at least in the short term, existing adaptations will be fine. Um, but again, I want to emphasize that adaptations um, need to consider water resources. Thanks. <laughs>